The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. This week, we continue last week's discussion of Elizabeth Crone's near-death experience after she was struck by lightning back in 1988. Her recent book, Changed in a Flash, One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All, um, was co-authored by our guest today, Jeffrey Kripal, who looked at Elizabeth's story through the eyes of a religious historian. Jeffrey Kripal is the J. Newton Razor Professor of Philosophy and Religious Thought and former chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University in Houston, Texas. His work includes the study of comparative erotics and ethics in mystical literature, American countercultural translations of Asian religions, and the history of Western esotericism from Gnosticism to New Age religions. Kripal's 2011 book, Authors of the Impossible, traces the history of psychic phenomena over the last two centuries. Jeff, welcome to NDE Radio. Thanks for having me, Lee. I'm happy to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. It's, uh, um, it, it's always interesting to talk to someone who is trying to put uh, a structure to or an explanation to some of the uh, near-death experiences that we explore in this show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the book you describe, religions as somewhat like science fiction. Uh, not because they don't contain truth, but because they see truth, as I understand it, uh, because they see truth from a particularly narrow point of view. Why did you pick such a, a loaded term, if I may ask, uh, like science fiction? And would you say the same thing is true for near-death experiences? Well, I'm drawing on another scholar there who described religion as a, a legitimate form of science fiction, which... I think he meant, you know, uh, real science fiction, as it were. Uh, I I like the expression because it it's edgy and it gets at this double edge that is religion that is somehow created or projected by human beings, and yet is also somehow tapped in something that's superhuman or or transcendent. And I think the genre of science fiction today often aims at these sorts of transcendent aesthetics or sublime aesthetics, and and yet we know that we're writing it. Um, and so I'm trying to get people to think about the same sorts of, of issues in the book when it comes to visionary experiences like near-death experiences, which are clearly scripted as well by by culture and by by our by our uh, ancestors mm-hmm. and also by our own personal worldview or point of view uh, if if I gather from the NDEs I've heard they're they're very personalized experiences right they're personal they're absolutely personal but they're also cultural they you know it, there's this paradox I'm trying to explore in that second half of the book in which in some sense we're writing or scripting these experiences and yet we're not. We're we're sort of split in two. We're sort of written and writing at the same time, and that's kind of the the paradox I'm trying I'm trying to get at with this metaphor of religion as science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, in the book, you refer to Plato's uh, analogy of the cave: people chained, staring at a wall, uh, destined to see what they would call reality as as mere shadows. And then when one of them can break free, they see the source of those shadows in the light of day, and their eyes are opened, and I presume if if it's like a near-death experience, they would call that reality. Would you say that the the equivalent experience is happening with a near-death experience? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, this is where my science fiction metaphor works again, because of course, the way most of us consume science fiction is by going into a dark theater and watching projected images on a screen. And that's essentially what Plato's cave was in Plato's time. It was a kind of primitive uh, projection technology, as it were. And what I'm trying to struggle with there with that metaphor is, again, this this obvious fact that what is being seen in these visions 
is being projected by some kind of cultural script, and yet it's also making a claim or being experienced as accessing reality in a deeper or a more profound way. And, and I'm trying to honor both of those both of those things at once with, with that image. But right. yeah, I think the near-death experiencer is, in our own culture and age, is precisely the person who breaks free of the chains and struggles out of the cave and sees the light, as it were, sometimes literally, and then mm. comes back into the dark cave to try to convince the rest of us, often to to great, um, great frustration. Do you suppose that uh, the near-death experiencer is seeing reality, or are they just seeing a, a newer, brighter set of shadows? So what, what I suggest in the book is that this sense of the near-death experience being more real than real is in fact accurate, but that it's a mistake to literalize or universalize the content of the visions. And so, again, I use this movie theater metaphor. Whatever it is we're seeing on the screen has been scripted or projected, but the light shining through the film is, in fact, very real. And I suggest that a near-death experience is essentially a kind of trip back into the projector that's projecting the light. And so the light Mm -hmm. itself is very real, but the forms it's taking are real and unreal at the same time, just like a movie that we watch. Right. It's a long. Yes, meta- I, I, it's a long metaphor, <laughs> Lee. I don't. I don't mean to be literal about the movie projector or the science fiction metaphor, but I think it helps us think through these paradoxes. Oh, I, I think it's an excellent metaphor. I, when you talk about in the book, you talk about the person who gets tired of watching the projection turns around. And looks into the projector itself and sees the what a, an ND ear would call the tunnel and the light. Yeah, uh, I think that that works very well. Um, but you also call the person in the audience part of the projection, and I was curious about that. Well, can you can you expand on that? I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Okay, there's a fellow sitting watching the movie. Yeah, and and then you say he turns he turns around. And finally, sees the projector itself and understands the source because the images are are uh, fiction, but the light is real. Right. But so the, but that, you're calling him part of the projection too, if if I understand it correctly. Right. I'm thinking of the NDE experiencer there, the visionary. You know, the the NDE vision is going on entirely inside the NDE experiencer, and so he or she is in some sense the projector. Um. But I think there is a kind of point where some of these experiencers turn around and essentially move back into the light, which is not them, which is somehow transcendent or somehow real in a way that our our cultural projections are not real. Mm. Uh, And so, again, I'm I'm just trying to struggle with the double fact that near-death experiencers are clearly shaped and scripted and formed by culture and are therefore relative. And the fact that people experience these visions as somehow contacting something that's much more real than any culture or religion or person. I'm trying to struggle with both of those those reported facts of, of, of a near-death experience. Right. I mean, people, I, I think that, so you, ha- you have to have a little sympathy for me. My, my job as a, as a comparativist is not to idolize or literalize one religious form and claim that it's real or true and every other religious form is false. That's that's not what I do. I, I try to understand everyone's religious experiences and then put them on a, a fair, flat, shared table and then look at the patterns and see what they all have in common and see how they're different and then try to form theories about what's actually going on in all of these experiences and not making claims about just one of them. Right. Uh, So that's, that's my job in the book. Uh, Elizabeth's job is to explain her near death experience, but my job is to 
help us understand her near-death experience in this broader comparative perspective. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> just as an aside, uh, she mentions that she, uh, even though she was not uh, seriously into the mystical side of Judaism, her son, who was also a contact uh, recipient of that lightning shock, has gone into uh, mystical Judaism or uh, or ultra orthodox Judaism, I guess you'd say. Yeah, he, Andy's part of the Chabad movement, which is a deeply mystical form of orthodox Judaism. And you know, we don't know, of course, if that's somehow the result of getting struck by the lightning that his mother was struck by, but. But, you know, it's it's certainly interesting. It is. It is. Well, where does religion come from, except uh, if if not from personal mystical experiences like near-death experiences? I, I would think all of the visions from all of the religions would have some sort of a common root there. I, I would not disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the question is, why do some of these personal visionary experiences become religions and most do not you know of course the vast majority of mystical experiences don't even go reported they they just disappear from history because they're not shared or they're not written down or they they're not giving a a public they're not given a public form where a very very few of these extraordinary experiences end up becoming the the seedbed as it were for you know new religions and eventually whole new civilizations Yes, but once you're confronted with a whole a bevy of established religions who don't want to hear anything new added to the text, <laughs> right. which we is always, what we're facing. <laughs> we always re, religious people always forget that their religion started out as a persecuted, you know, minority of some other religion. And uh, they forget that when they become the majority. But but that's how religions start out. They start out as these little bitty persecuted minorities. That's right. And uh, and some are still persecuted today. The uh, well, in fact, a lot a lot of them are. Uh, but rather than go there, uh, we were talking about movies earlier, and it had triggered my. Um, Memories of the Matrix series of movies. Yeah. Uh, the Matrix movies saw most people living in a shared fantasy world, the Matrix, right. but waking to reality was really a lot worse than the dream. <laughs> right. Which is, which is why Cypher decided to opt out and, and, uh, to go back to taste a steak again. Yet in the end, both, uh, at the end, love seemed to transcend both the virtual and the so-called real world, world and, I was wondering if you see that as a as a possibility. How do, love is such a an overriding theme in most near death experiencers' um, um, remembrances of what they saw. How do you factor that into it? Well, I mean, this is the the ultimate message of Elizabeth's experience. Of course, is is the reality of unconditional love, and um, I I don't think we can understand these experiences without you know, confronting that basic conviction. Um, it's hard to understand because we, we live in worlds of, you know, that are almost completely devoid of love, much less unconditional love. But clearly that's the message of a lot of near-death experiences, and that's that's what makes them so hopeful, I think, and what, what draws us to them. Mm-hmm. The other thing that they talk about... Um and the years. Um, some of them see love as the ultimate reality. Some say consciousness. Right. How do you how do you think those two equate? Well, you know, love. So love is a it's a loaded word, of course, and it it tends to have a kind of monotheistic kind of Western ring to it. Um, if you look at these experiences, I think in the Asian religions, you're going to you're going to tend more to languages like bliss and consciousness and mind and stuff. So I think I think if you have an experience of ultimate reality that's deeply personal and you, one is raised in a culture that is filled with God talk, you're going to get some kind of language of love coming in. 
but if you have an experience of ultimate reality that's not personal, that is somehow beyond the personal, and uh, you were raised in a you know in an Asian religion like Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism or something, then I think you're you're probably going to have an experience that's more defined by what we would call consciousness or mind or or, or spirit. Um, I mean, those are again very general comparative observations, but I think I think whether you experience this ultimate reality as consciousness or as or as love will depend largely on the cultural framework, but it, it's probably the same reality hmm. at the end of the day. I have, I've heard some people who come back talking of consciousness as saying um, everything material has consciousness. Yeah. Uh, one fellow who bumped into a desk and, and got a conscious reaction from the desk while he was out of his body, for example. Yeah. Um, and I, I was thinking... And I haven't read any of your books that that explore um, the erotic. I think it's really interesting that that a uh, a history of religion teacher would be exploring the erotic as well. But uh, do you think it's it's particularly mammalian of us to um, equate love and um, affection for one another with uh, God's love for us? Well, yeah, of course it is. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think I think all religious talk and all religious experience is somehow a projection of the human. But I also think that there's something ultimately divine about our humanity, and so it's a to me it's a kind of mystery that we pro- we 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 can only experience ourselves on those kinds of levels by projecting it outside of ourselves as some kind of external God or, or God with a capital G. But it's really us that I think we're experiencing. Um, and by us, I don't mean Lee or Jeff. I mean some deeper shared form of of humanity itself. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's all very much culturally conditioned, but I don't I don't think ultimately it, 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 it it's about culture. I think it's mm-hmm. about us. With, you know, with a capital U there. I've talked to some people who've um, taken trips on ayahuasca, and yeah. uh, they oh, encounter, well. they often encounter reptilian forms who uh, may, may make outrageous claims like, we created the the world. And uh, th- there's one little book, I can't remember the author, I was trying to remember the author's name today, where he went, did this trip and he came back and the shaman told him, Oh, they always say that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> That's what they all say. Right. Uh, but if uh, a reptile form of, um, which by the way, classical or traditional Christians think of as, as evil because of the Garden of Eden story, if that particular species doesn't feel love the way mammals feel love, does that change the nature of God for their aspect, their point of view as well? I yeah, I'm not sure I follow the question. I mean, obviously, if if something reptilian shows up in a visionary experience, it's it's again a projection of the human. It's not an actual reptile speaking to us. So I, you know, I, I would always question, well, what does the reptile mean in that particular framework or for that particular person? And so, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I get what you're asking. You're, you're asking if love is, is somehow a projection of the human and that another species would have a completely different experience. And yes, I, yeah, I suspect you're right. I mean, do, do, Snakes or, or frogs have near-death experiences. I, mm. you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we would know. Uh, I mean, we we barely believe that other humans have them. So, you know, I, I right. don't know how we're going to get to the point of of considering animals having them, um, even though they may well have them. Uh, many many near death experiencers believe in the the notion that their pets will rejoin them in heaven. In fact, many of them have seen deceased pets when they've gone on a on a near death experience. So yeah, 
So, I mean, oh God, you're you're going down lots of rabbit holes here, Lee. I, you know, <laughs> I mean, so I, you know, I, I have. I'm a, sorry, I, Jeff. It's okay. I mean, I assume that's what your show's about. I, I have a dog I that I absolutely adore. Her name's Delilah, and you know, my wife's actually jealous of her a lot because uh, you know I'm so close to Delilah. Um, but Jeff, then then I'll Jeff, turn I... around and I'll like eat a steak or a hamburger. I'm you know eating some poor creature. So mm. why do I eat cows, but I don't eat Delilah? You know, wh- where do we draw that line? Why why do we think our pets have souls, but the cows we eat don't? You know, and that's where I think it, it really is about culture, and it's not about the pets or the cows. Um, and that's, again, because of this comparative perspective. All the, different cultures draw the line in different places, and you know there are whole there are thousands of cultures on the planet that think all of these animals have souls, all of them. Mm. Um, yes. But th- that doesn't mean they become vegetarians. You know they just develop rituals to hunt and kill and eat these ensouled creatures and and deal with that that belief or that fact in their world. Um, so I you know <laughs> I guess I'm just I'm just suspicious of my own worldview, which I suspect is probably your worldview. And why we draw the lines where we do, I think it's pretty arbitrary. I have to tell you, I my dog's name is Samson, and my <laughs> wife is my wife is jealous of our relationship too. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like our two dogs belong to each other. <laughs> they they probably do, perhaps in some previous lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> um. Let's see. You say that those those serpents are are projections. That serpents wouldn't talk to us during a, a, an ayahuasca trip or an out of body experience. But well, what if what what if what if they do? What if they can? Well, it, it, even if they could, they would still appear to us through our own filters and through our own assumptions. Um, mm. You know, that's the problem. You know how how does one species communicate with another and how do we know when we meet an animal or a being in a dream or a vision that we're actually encountering something out there or whether we're encountering some other aspect of ourselves i mean i think that's the 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 million dollar question here um and what i'm suggesting is you know listen i i've studied thousands and thousands of religious experiences i've never studied a religious experience that that a human being didn't have um, so my assumption is that all religious experiences are, at the end of the day, human. But the question then becomes, well, what do we mean by human? What are the limits of the human? And what I'm suggesting is that there are no limits to the human, that the human is, is ultimately what we call God or divine. It's just some some dimension of ourselves that we, we normally have no connection to or no awareness of or no no way to get at and what makes near death experiences so special and so important is they essentially give us a way to get in contact with that that god side of ourselves mm-hmm. uh, which of course we then project and turn it into something external like like god but it's it's really us um and so that you know that would be my own position that that wouldn't necessarily be elizabeth's but that's certainly the way I think about these things. Right. St. Paul, who is said to have had a near-death experience, um, uh, also said we are already seated in the heavenlies, which which creates the notion of our uh, heaven-based selves operating some sort of avatars down here on Earth, right. like creating right. a, a video game situation. Right. Right. Uh, we're just well, playing these, playing this for our own entertainment. It's kind of what Elizabeth was getting at, right, with her notion of the double or the the, the angel the, mm-hmm. the, that accompanies one into this life. I don't know if you spoke to her about that or not, but it's sort of her meta, metaphysical vision as well, is that we all have this double or this twin or this angel that accompanies us into, into each life we live. Uh, are you kind, familiar? Go ahead. I was just saying that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is – is is that what how we think of ourselves is usually very limited and 
and all of these these stories of this other angel or this other part of ourself that that is essentially divine and from the heavens as it were is is again a mythical kind of intuition about our our deeper selves who we really are mm. uh, i mean i feel like an avatar a lot don't you feel like you're in a game <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> sometimes it's a relief and sometimes it's a concern. I can't figure out which is which. Yeah, I'm usually losing the game. A... <laughs> <laughs> um, have you? Do you remember the movie The Thirteenth Floor? I never saw it. Lee. Oh, you, you should see it. It's it's very much like that. It's like, um, uh, well. This fellow goes to the end of the world. He goes, crosses the, the boundaries, the borders, and discovers that he has come to the end of the game that's being projected and that he's part of the game. Uh-huh. And he, he goes to seek out who the, who the players are who are manipulating everything. And in the end, the implication is that the players who are manipulating everything are being manipulated by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's really it's an old movie, but it, it, it would be worth looking for. Um, and but I wanted to ask you if um, if you think there are levels of reality like that. I do actually. Yeah, I think it's. I don't think they're clean, but you know, I do think there are levels upon levels upon levels, and and that it's you know, it's really hard from where we sit to. To determine what those are. Mm. I mean, you know, but to get back to the book, I mean, the basic idea of the book for me and my half was that that these near death experiences are so important because we're essentially rewriting the afterlife through them. We're rewriting the game, to use the metaphor we're we're using right now. Yes. And that even by writing such a book and reading such a such a book and talking about such a book on a radio show we are subtly informing the way our descendants will experience their own near deaths and their own afterlives you know we're we're scripting the the science fiction movie that they're going to die into as we talk about these things mm. and um the the modern near death experience is so important because it's essentially us writing our own futures and the imaginations and the worlds will we will die into and our and our descendants will die into. And of course they'll engage in their own rewriting and just goes on like that from generation to generation. Because the the afterlife does change. Um people don't experience the same afterlife in two thousand eighteen that they did in, you know, twelve eighteen or six eighteen. That's right. The uh the hell of uh Dante is not, not anywhere in the New Age experience. No, no, it's not. I don't think there's a lot of talk of unconditional love either, in, you know, in a text like Dante. No. Well, Jeff, this has been great, and it's <laughs> we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, but well, I hope. So, but go ahead. I'm just. I'm sorry we fell down through so many rabbit holes and that I couldn't pull us out of any of them. <laughs> Listen, that, that, that was my fault because as I was reading the, the second half of the book, all these thoughts were coming to my mind. Then I had to ask you about it. And, uh, but I would strongly recommend that, uh, folks go out and uh, buy a copy of Changed in a Flash. Uh, tell, uh, tell the audience how, um, they can get a copy of your book. Well, in any bookstore, you know, it's on all the, I mean, can we say the word Amazon on, on the radio? I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to get it, of course. But you could you can get it in any you know good bookstore. Any good bookstore can order it for you. Okay. I I hope people will go to their bookstores and then try to support them. Amazon has taken such a hit on bookstores in general. Yeah. Hey Jeff, thank you for telling us uh, um, all about uh, your part of this fascinating book. Uh, if listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our past shows, especially including Elizabeth's uh, of last week, uh, just go to our uh, website at nderadio.org and hit the past shows button. For information about IANS, just go to their website at iands.org. And be with us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.